Ahead of four, he's accused of walking into a Walgreens, holding a rifle and demanding drugs and money. Today, this man faced a judge. What happened in court? Also at four, one of the driving change bills hits a speed bump. Why the state Senate did not vote on it today. And e-cigarette use among middle school and high school students is increasing. But a new study finds teens might not realize they're ingesting nicotine. A look at the dangers. Also, we're following breaking news. A child on a bike is hit by a semi. Those stories and more ahead on News 6 at 4. That is just 60 seconds away. Stay with Live, getting results. This is News 6 at 4. Breaking right now, a boy on a bike is hit and killed by a semi-truck. Sky 6 is live over the crash scene on Landstar Boulevard and East Weatherby Road. That's in Orange County. The Florida Highway Patrol is on scene investigating what happened. They say they're trying to locate the truck driver. The boy was taken to Arnold Palmer Hospital. That's where he died. We have a crew headed to the scene. We will continue to bring you updates right here and on ClickOrlando.com. A man shoots inside a drugstore, faced a judge. Now at four, what police are revealing about the armed suspect. Employees inside the Walgreens called 911 begging for help after the suspect jumped the pharmacy counter. This is News 6 at 4. I'm Ginger Gadsden. I'm Lisa Bell. And I'm Julie Broughton. This is a story we first brought you as breaking news yesterday at 4. That's when we told you an armed man walked into the Walgreens near West International Speedway Boulevard and South Ridgewood Avenue. He screamed, demanding money and drugs. Today, News 6 is Lauren Korn went to court. She joins us live in Daytona Beach outside the courthouse. And Lauren, what happened today? Well, here, Julie, at the jail, he did not say a word during first appearance, and he's being held without bond. You're going to hear those 911 calls from yesterday, and we're also, also learning a bit more about where this man came from. 41-year-old Lewis Curler is donning an orange jumpsuit today, hours after police say the armed man approached the pharmacy counter inside Walgreens demanding drugs and money. I don't know if he's under the influence of something, but he's trying to hide in the pharmacy and he said people are out to get him. Police say Curler was hospitalized at Halifax Health Medical Center a day or two prior before showing up to the store Tuesday afternoon, as you see in surveillance video. Within seconds, you hear the situation quickly escalating. Oh, he's, in, he's got a rifle. Hurry up, he's got a rifle. As one employee tells 911 she must evacuate the store, another pharmacy tech calls 911 from outside. I just started jumping the counter, and I, my pharmacist came, went towards him, and I ran out of the pharmacy. And yeah, as I was running out, I saw him pull out the gun. <laughs> And, um, and I just ran and got people out of the store. I don't police say Curler then injected the narcotics as police raced to the counter. That's when they say he stood up with the rifle pointed in their direction. Police firing one shot, striking Curler in the lower buttocks area. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Judge Weston. We're here this afternoon for first appearance. Today, Curler's public defender argued for the judge to grant a bond, while the state argued for two additional charges of aggravated assault with a firearm and kidnapping. The judge declined to rule on the motion at this time. Now, please tell us they are working with ATF to figure out where this gun came from, how we got a hold of it, but they do tell us that it was not reported stolen. Julie? Lauren, thank you. Lauren Korn reporting live for us. Driving change hits a possible roadblock. Today, the state Senate temporarily postponed a vote on the bill. It comes one day after the state House passed a similar bill. News 6 anchor Matt Austin has been pushing for results since 2016. That's when a driver who admitted to texting rear-ended his car. Matt is still in Tallahassee today. And Matt, do we know why the Senate has postponed their vote? I was told that they still have some things to work out as the Senate bill and the House bill are still different at this point. I want to remind you of last year when the House overwhelmingly passed a bill that would have made texting and driving a primary offense in the state of Florida, and the Senate killed it in committee. So a lot of people inside the building behind me are wondering, is the Senate going to drop the ball again on this issue? It was temporarily postponed. We're going to have to find out for how long and if they will bring it back up. I'm sure negotiations are going on right now. Now, if the Senate and the House do agree on this and they pass a version of it, it's going to go to the governor's desk and he needs to sign it. So I ran into the secretary of the Department of Transportation today. He was appointed by the governor and I asked him if the governor would sign this bill. He had a strange response. 
Does the governor plan on signing these if they come across his desk? I, have, I haven't had a chance to talk to the governor because, as you heard, a lot of things can change mm -hmm. as the bills get moved along. I just want to reinforce our commitment is always safety first as well as his commitment. So as we pri prioritize projects and work in our program, we look at safety and what can we do to improve highway safety. What, how much of a priority is texting and driving in the governor's mansion? I don't have any, haven't had a chance to have that conversation with him. Well, if you were advising him, would you advise him to sign one of these bills? I would have I always advised, as he has advised us, that safety should be our number one priority. So kind of strange answers from the secretary of the Department of Transportation openly admitting that he hasn't really talked to the governor about texting and driving legislation uh, at all. At least that's what he said to me. I am going to head back into the Capitol, see if I can get some answers about this temporary postponement. And uh, we will let you know, I was told from someone in the president of the Senate's office, they are not expecting a vote on this today as they try to work out these details. So we'll have to wait and see. Ladies, back to you. All right, Matt Austin covering it all for us in Tallahassee. Thank you. To read our past stories about driving change and the timeline of it all, you can head to clickorlando.com slash driving change. New at four, a SWAT standoff is over and a known criminal is in custody. Orange County deputies say they spotted a stolen car parked in a driveway on Fifth Avenue in Taft. They say they made contact with the people inside the home and several people willingly came out. However, they say one man refused to leave, and that's when they called SWAT. The more than six-hour standoff ended when the suspect walked out of the home. Deputies say the suspect has a criminal history involving drugs and violence. His name has not yet been released. Right now, deputies are investigating two separate shootings involving teens. First, a 17-year-old is shot in the head on South 5th Street in Bithlow. Orange County deputies say the teen was shot after a fight. According to the arrest affidavit, the suspects were trying to get their daughter, who did not come home after school, but their stories differ after that. Anita Rios and Pedro Mendez Santiago claim they felt threatened, so they fired their guns as warning shots. Now they're both facing aggravated assault with a firearm charges. Deputies say they found two guns inside their car. The teen is now in stable condition at the hospital. Also in Orange County, deputies say a 19-year-old man was shot just before 2.30 this morning. It happened at the Somerset Apartments along Lee Road. Investigators say the victim was shot more than once but is expected to be okay. Deputies have not said anything about a possible suspect or what led to the shooting. Developing right now, the man accused of killing a Winter Park caregiver or caretaker is in court. A judge is trying to decide if he is competent to stand trial. Scott Nelson was forced into court today after he refused to go. In letters, he wrote everyone knows he's competent and that he wants a fast and speedy trial. But his attorneys are trying to argue he is not competent. They say he has a brain injury, suffers from bipolar disorder, and has a below average IQ. However, the state has had its own expert who contradicted Nelson's bipolar disorder. Now the judge is hearing both sides and will make the final decision. Nelson is accused of kidnapping and murdering Winter Park caretaker Jennifer Fulford back in 2017. A dispute over a bathroom ends with a man stabbed and a senior citizen in jail. Deland police and Volusia County deputies arrested 72-year-old Dan Johnson on stabbing charges. They say he got angry with his 29-year-old nephew, Michael Johnson, because he took too long in the bathroom. They say the uncle opened the door and stabbed him several times inside a home on East Beersford Avenue. I've been to your house three or four times. I've got help coming to you, okay? I mean, the person that did this to you still there? Yeah. Please hurry up. Michael Johnson was airlifted to Halifax Health Medical Center in Daytona Beach and is expected to survive. Now turning to results 2020, potentially the last big name candidate is about to enter the race for the Democratic presidential nomination. Reports say former Vice President Joe Biden will launch his campaign tomorrow. Ed O'Keefe is covering the 2020 campaign from Washington, D.C. This country can't afford more years of a president looking to settle personal scores. We've got to get moving. Former Vice President Biden will enter the race for the 2020 Democratic nomination in a place he's never been. On top, the latest polling shows him leading the large field of 2020 Democratic hopefuls with 27 percent, 
seven percent ahead of Senator Bernie Sanders. We will take back this country. I mean it. Don't give up. Biden's PAC sent an email to supporters Tuesday hinting that an announcement is coming soon, though he's been toying with the idea of getting into the race for more than a year. What's the holdup? Yeah. What's the holdup? Putting everything together, man. Admitting back in February, his family was on board while he wasn't there yet. They, the most important people in my life, want me to run. Since then, at least eight women have alleged that Biden made them feel uncomfortable in the past, actions for which he later partially apologized. I'm sorry I didn't understand more. I'm not sorry for any of my intentions. Biden has made a run for president twice before. I sat down with him in late 2007. Once I'm covered, I'm convinced. Me matched against Obama, me matched against Hillary, me matched against anyone else. I will do just fine. Joe Biden! But Biden ended up placing fifth in the Iowa caucus. He dropped out, but later became Barack Obama's vice president. He chose not to run in 2016 after the death of his son, Beau, the year before. I regret it every day, but it was the right decision for my family and for me. At 76, Biden will be the second oldest candidate in what's already a crowded field. And while he's popular with working class voters, it's unclear if he'll enjoy similar support from an increasingly younger, more liberal Democratic Party, less familiar with his more than four decades of public service. Ed O'Keefe, CBS News, Washington. Well, it's been called a youth epidemic by the FDA, and now there are new concerns when it comes to vaping. What a new report reveals about teens and the highly addictive habit. Tom. Truly warm in a large part of the country feels like spring. Look at that, 61 in Columbus, 69 in Minneapolis. 84 in Orlando. I'll be right back. We'll pinpoint the overnight lows tonight, talk about the heat for tomorrow, and then the storms for part of your weekend. And the price of treating diabetes in the U.S. is expensive, and a new study finds it's more expensive than other countries. A look at why next at 4. You're watching News 6 at 4, getting results. We will be right back. And during the break, we are streaming live on Facebook. Search Lisa Bell News on Facebook right now. Yes for less. Live with Ginger Gadsden, Lisa Bell, Julie Broughton. Weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells and Meteorologist Candace Campos. This is News 6 at 4, getting results. We are staying on top of some breaking news happening in Orange County right now. A boy on a bike is hit and killed by a semi-truck. Sky 6 is live over the crash scene. You can see it's a very active scene. This is on Landstar Boulevard and East Weatherby Road. The Florida Highway Patrol is investigating what happened. We'll continue to ask questions and bring you updates right here and on ClickOrlando.com. More than 7 million Americans depend on insulin to stabilize their blood sugar. A new report shows many of them are struggling to pay for medication that would cost far less outside the U.S. Natalie Brand takes a look at the drug price fight. Bronte. Yep. Bronte Fulner was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 8 years old. Now 13, she uses an insulin pump to keep her blood sugar at safe levels. It's so critical that I have insulin at all times. Fulner joined Maryland Democrat Elijah Cummings to release the findings of a Congressional Committee staff report exploring the skyrocketing cost of diabetes medications. For seniors and other Medicare beneficiaries in our Congressional District, the cost of a, a widely used insulin would be 92% lower, listen to this, at Australian prices, 82% lower at UK prices. Cummings says that's in part because Medicare is not allowed to negotiate directly with drug makers. After years of hefty price increases, some patients are skipping or rationing their medication. They will tell me that they're not buying the insulin because they need to buy their food. Lawmakers have held a series of hearings on the issue with both parties demanding answers from pharmaceutical companies. If you think you can, you know, just out talk us without any transparency, without any accountability, I just want you to know your days are numbered. Drug makers blame the troubled health care system plus the cost of innovation. Some have made moves to lower prices, but frustrated lawmakers say it's a life and death problem that needs a better cure. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington.
All right, Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells okay. joins us now. Not a bad day out there. It is a bit on the warm side, dare I say hot. I'm not complaining. That's how I knew that would shake out. <laughs> I'm always happy, Tom, with what? the weather. <laughs> Who no. are you? Your <laughs> nose is growing. He's fine today. <laughs> it feels fantastic. Yeah. It really does. Tonight, things hang in there pretty well. We'll be mostly clear for the evening hours. A little bit of cloud cover starts to build in through the day tomorrow, but tonight we are perfect. We'll be mild. There may be some patchy fog late night. If there is a problem with the fog, it won't be in downtown Orlando. It'll be in our northern zones. So I think for 95% of you, nothing happens. Tomorrow, dry but hot. The daytime high tomorrow back to about 88 could punch through 90 in some of the outlying areas. Then on Friday, well, everything changes. Scattered storms do return on Friday with rain chances at 60%. Here's the satellite and radar together. Big trouble brewing back out in Texas. You'll see all kinds of talk about what goes on in Texas a little later in the newscast here with Candace Campos. This cold front's going to sweep this way. As it marches across the country, our ridge of high pressure is still dominant, blanketing all that stuff away from us, keeping it way back out west. But every hour, the high is giving away just this much and moving farther to the east. As it does, rain chances march in across the Gulf. Right now, you can't tell that. It's 82 degrees in Daytona Beach and perfect. Wind from the east at nine. Orlando Health Camera has a temperature downtown of 84. That is near perfection as well. Tips where you live, well, 87 in Gainesville, 85 in Sanford. 78 Cocoa Beach. We are at 80 in Melbourne and 80 out at the Cape. Radar tonight. Drive from Melbourne all the way up to Palm Coast right now. We're good with no radar echoes to track. By Friday, that will be a different story altogether. Here's the water vapor loop. Now keep in mind, we're not as covered up with the dark or the orange anymore. You see it fading out because low level moisture is beginning to come in. You're feeling the humidity and at the upper levels, more and more moisture is building in. It won't be until Friday. The things really change though. Come take a look. Here's 4 p.m. this evening. We're all good by seven o'clock. No worries, dinner outside, you bet. But by tomorrow, it's gonna be super hot and more and more clouds begin to show up. Here's what I really want you to see. This is Friday, 7 a.m. Right here is the leading edge of our frontal boundary rain. See it push in? Here's Friday, 10 a.m. From Ocala to the villages, raining. Storms push into Orlando by noon. By three or four o'clock in the afternoon, it looks like the first big rain is done and only lingering light stuff is left. So right now, Friday evening plans look good. Lows tonight, 50s and 60s all over in Orlando. I'm calling it 60, patchy fog north. Here's tomorrow. Your forecast is brought to you by your Southern Lexus dealers. First thing tomorrow morning, 63 degrees at 7 a.m. with fog north. The high makes it all the way back to 88. Check out the week ahead. Daytime high tomorrow goes to 88 degrees, sunny, then raining on Friday, a high of 84. Saturday and Sunday are both pretty good days, highs in the mid-80s, and rain chances are low, low, low. Tom, thank you. Well, there are new concerns when it comes to teens and e-cigarettes. Ahead of four, what some schools are doing to combat vaping. Then all new at five. I'm Eric Von Egg, and coming up in the next hour, I'm going to show you how technology has evolved almost in a scary way that bad guys are using to skim your credit card at the pump these days, and also how it's evolved for deputies catching them and getting crime results. That story next. Savings on Edge. E-cigarette use among middle and high school students is an increasing concern for schools. New research suggests many kids don't realize they're vaping nicotine or just how addictive it can be. Tom Hansen sat down with some students trying to educate their peers about the dangers. Caitlin Myers and Davin Turner have seen firsthand how popular vaping is in high school. I know a lot of people that vape and it's like constant, constant and then especially in the beginning of the school year, everyone just had it out in the hallway. Use of e-cigarettes has skyrocketed, especially among adolescents and teens. Do you think that teens think it's harmless? Yeah. I definitely do because if they knew, then nobody would be doing this as much. Now, a new study suggests many kids aren't aware how much nicotine they're getting when they vape. I'm very concerned. Researchers at Stony Brook Children's Hospital surveyed people under 21 about their tobacco, e-cigarette, and marijuana habits. They found 40% who used in the past week didn't realize their products contained nicotine, but tests showed they had significant levels of the chemical in their system. These kids are using these very high-content products, and they're, you know, potentially going to get addicted, and they don't know what's going on. 
North Babylon High School in New York is among schools trying to teach kids about e-cigarettes through a new program called Vape Out. That's our ultimate goal, is to create awareness and education for students who haven't started these things yet. Students like Caitlin and Davin will also talk to younger students about the dangers of e-cigarettes. They've heard enough from the adults and the stuff, and it, I feel like it'd be more effective to hear it from us. And we want to go there just to give them, you know, the information of the dangerous chemicals that are in it and, you know, the risk of addiction. They hope kids get the message so they never get hooked. Tom Hansen, CBS News, North Babylon, New York. All new on News 6 at 430, hurricane season is just weeks away. Our house is paid for, so it's like, you know, it's our investment. I just don't want to, I don't want to see it floating down the creek, you know. How one local city is making sure they are ready. Plus, local dancers getting a big nod from Beyonce. Why the singer is crazy in love with their moves. Morgan and Morgan. Live, this is News 6. We are staying on top of breaking news. A boy is hit and killed by a semi-truck. Right now, investigators are still looking for the truck driver. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Ginger Gadsden. I'm Julie Broughton. And I'm Lisa Bell. News 6's Nikki Zizaza is live on the scene on Landstar Boulevard and East Weatherby Road in Orange County with the latest. Nikki. Ladies, this is an incredibly sad situation and it's all unfolding right now. I'm standing at the intersection of Landstar and Weatherby where FHP investigators responded to the scene just after 2.30 this afternoon. Now Sky 6 was overhead as all of this was going down. What we know at this time is that a juvenile traveling on a bicycle was struck by a semi truck. At this time, it's still not clear whether the driver of that semi truck is even aware the collision occurred. Officials with FHP holding back on classifying this as a hit and run. Now the minor was transported to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital where the juvenile was pronounced dead. Now FHP investigators are here at the crash scene collecting evidence, trying to piece together what may have gone wrong here. As we've been out here, we've seen investigators walking up and down this stretch of road. Um, there is a bicycle we believe the juvenile was traveling on that is just behind the cruiser just behind me right there. Now we this is still a very active investigation and as soon as we learn more information we'll be sure to bring that to you. For now I'm live in Orlando, Nikki Zaza getting results, New Six. Just an awful situation, Nikki. Thank you. Also breaking right now, police investigating near a home in Cocoa Beach. They tell us they are following up on a tip. So we want to get right out to New Six's James Barbero, who is live at the scene right now. And James have police given you any details about what they're even investigating. We can see more than the official details we've been given, Ginger. This is a house on Woodland and 4th in Cocoa Beach, and back there, the Cocoa Beach Police and the Brevard Sheriff's Office, they're using an excavator, and they're digging up something in a yard. It's a vacant home. I'll try to be as smooth as I can as I step back here and give you a closer look. The police would not tell us how long they've been out here. They would not tell us when the tip came in or the nature of this tip, but as you can see, there's a lot of them back there. They have a screen right there. They've set up something to obstruct our view. What you see there labeled Brevard Sheriff's Office. We see the crime scene investigators are here. There's plenty of vehicles parked out here on the street. There's a large presence from the community wondering what's going on here. We did just speak with a spokesperson for the police department a few moments ago, and they wouldn't elaborate on anything further than a tip that they're investigating. They do want to stress that there is no danger to the community. We have seen that excavator in action earlier, not in most right now but it seems like they've got a lot of work ahead of them as we work to learn exactly what's going on we'll be back with you later today on news 6 and we'll have any new information we will pass it on to you right here on news 6 and clickorlando.com live in Cocoa Beach I'm James Sparvero getting results news 6 back to you James thank you all new at 430, Mount Doors Police Department is once again in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. We just learned a sergeant was placed on paid leave. That's two investigations involving the same department in less than a month. News 6's Vanessa Ariza is live at the Mount Dora Police Department. And Vanessa, this comes after news of the police chief being put on leave. That's right, Julie, and that police chief remains on paid leave tonight. Now you have another member of the Mount Dora Police Department. You have a sergeant who was recently put on paid leave. The reasoning behind the internal investigation that was launched on him, standards of conduct. 
It has not been a good month for the Mount Dora Police Department. Their chief of police, John O'Grady, is on paid leave after reports of inappropriate racial comments he made at a charity event earlier this month. Two days after the reported comments were made, another employee within the department was placed on paid leave. Sergeant Keith Taylor has been on leave since April 15th. The former Marine is in his ninth year with the department. The city released a statement today saying, quote, Sergeant Keith Taylor was relieved of duty with pay on April 15, 2019, pending the outcome of a standards of conduct investigation. A spokesperson for the city wouldn't delve into the accusations that prompted the investigation and declined interviews. According to the department's policy, a standards conduct investigation is defined as such. Members shall not engage in any conduct that constitutes neglect of duty, conduct on becoming an officer or city employee, or any act that is likely to adversely affect the discipline, good order, or reputation of the department. The department is compromised of 75 employees. Within a two-year span, four employees within the police department have been placed on paid leave. Sergeant Taylor marking the latest. And Sergeant Taylor declined to comment at the advice of his union and labor attorney. Now, we also contacted the mayor as well as council members and asked them for their opinions on two of these members being placed on paid leave. We got a few responses. We'll share them with you coming up tonight at 6 o'clock. But for now, live in Mount Dora, Vanessa Ariza, getting results, News 6. Vanessa, thank you. Dozens of people arrested in a meth trafficking bust. Now, these are just some of the 47 suspects arrested in Polk County's Operation Meth Death Peddlers. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd announcing today the investigation got 50 pounds of meth valued at nearly one and a half million dollars off the streets. The sheriff says the investigation, which started back in 2016, landed some heavy hitters behind bars. We learned that Asession, he's up here on the top left, Nahara was moving multi kilos of methamphetamine. In 2017, we advanced the next year that we learned that Martin Delgado, who is here in the pink, was also a multi kilo dealer of methamphetamine. All of the suspects are collectively charged with 85 felonies and 50 misdemeanors. Of those arrested, nine are in the country illegally. A man accused of killing his own family is headed back to court. Grant Amato will have a hearing tomorrow to see if he can get out of jail before his trial. Amato's mom, dad, and brother were all found dead at their Chuliota home in January. Investigators say Amato shot them to death after stealing $200,000 in order to talk to a woman in Bulgaria. New tonight, former Democratic gubernatorial candidate Andrew Gillum has agreed to pay thousands of dollars in fines to settle a lengthy ethics investigation. The investigation stems from allegations Gillum violated civil law by accepting gifts from a lobbyist. Now, that included trips to Costa Rica and New York. The State Ethics Commission agreed to drop four of the five counts of ethics violations. Gillum agreed to pay $5,000 in fines. In a statement, Gillum responded saying he, quote, never knowingly violated any ethics laws. Once I was made aware of the issue, I took responsibility, end quote. Hurricane season is almost here, and for one Seminole County community, that means finishing up big projects to protect against any potential damage. News 6's Clay Lepard shows us what a million-dollar grant is doing in Castleberry. This is Chris Fournier's home, and this is what's left of their backyard after city leaders say they had to do something because G Creek was eroding the ground so much that there was a fear this home could wash away. It doesn't look intimidating, but G Creek here in Castlebury can swell up like it did in 2017 after Hurricane Irma, when much of the county was dealing with flooding issues. It's uh, eroded a lot. This backyard is one of several spots in Castlebury getting an upgrade. And so now there is, of course, no, nowhere to mow down there anymore. About 15 feet of it has disappeared from erosion since Fournier and her family moved in 42 years ago. Our house is paid for, so it's like, you know, it's our investment. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to see it floating down the creek, you know. There wasn't really anything preventing these homes from eroding, sort of sliding, their backyard sliding into the creek over time. A million dollars through a federal grant means these rock-filled wire cages can go in and protect against future erosion. Several square miles drains right here. 
So uh, when, we get, when we get a big, big storm event like Irma, um, it makes a big difference on this creek. It's all being put in place before hurricane season starts back up in June. It, it would be more eroded. I mean, I'd probably lose probably 10 more feet. In Castleberry, Clay Lepard. We hope we don't get any more major 100-year storm events for a while. Getting results, News 6. Hollywood meets the Space Coast. After the break, we will show you which big name celeb was spotted hanging out in Central Florida. And Beyonce leaving two local dancers shocked. Beyonce has 127 million followers. Never in this world would I have thought that she would even, like, dare see a video um, that I posted. What she did after she saw his video that has a lot of people talking. And cracking down on smoking. How two stores are trying to keep kids from lighting up. You're watching News 6 at 430, getting results. We will be right back. This portion of the news is sponsored by Papa John's. Live with Ginger Gadsden, Lisa Bell, Julie Broughton. Weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells and Meteorologist Candace Campos. This is News 6 at 4, getting results. We are getting a closer look at the mess on I-4 this morning. This pink tractor trailer tipped over, dumping lumber all over the eastbound lanes and backing up traffic mm. for hours during the heart of rush hour. The crash happened just after 6 a.m. at Maitland Boulevard, and things did not get cleaned up until around 9.30 this morning. Meantime, the westbound ramp on I-4 at Maitland Boulevard is set to open in just a few days. It's part of the I-4 Ultimate Project, expanding 21 miles of the interstate. News 6's Mark Lehman has what you need to know. Transportation officials say this isn't necessarily a major change, but it's one that could catch a lot of drivers off guard. This ramp right here is where we are talking about. And all this is happening in a spot that's seen some of the biggest changes when it comes to the I-4 Ultimate Project. Well, it's been a mess. Yes, it's, it's been a mess. And drivers in Maitland are gearing up for another shift as workers will be opening the seventh new ramp since construction began. Quite a transformation. I mean, a completely different road. You wouldn't even recognize it. For this one, FDOT will be permanently closing the surface street between Keller and Lake Destiny Road. That means drivers on eastbound Maitland Boulevard will be seeing something different when getting onto westbound I-4. So as you're heading towards I-4, you'll need to get up into those elevated lanes and then pair off to the right onto a new permanent ramp. For those down on Lake Destiny, the current ramp will remain open, but this change will put work one step closer to the eventual completion of what's been a painstaking overhaul. There's some light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still looking at six months to a year probably until all the work is done here in Maitland. I know the ultimate goal of this is to improve things. So... Um, I guess if you have to put up with the construction to make it better. Now this right here is a tricky spot to keep in mind when you're driving through this area as three lanes of traffic will be merging all at once. This new on-ramp to I-4 westbound is scheduled to open first thing Friday morning. In Maitland, Mark Lehman getting results, New 6. Okay, so a little star power in Brevard County. That's right, don't adjust your screen. Actor Robert <laughs> De Niro was spotted at Pier 220 in Titusville yesterday. The restaurant sharing these pictures with News 6 of De Niro hanging out with some of the workers there. How cool is that? They tell us he had been visiting the Space Center and then he came over to their restaurant with his son and one other person. They ordered a bunch of appetizers, some lobster bisque and dessert. I want to have lunch with him now. <laughs> he stuck around for about an hour and a half. I That's love, really cool. Yeah, and people yeah. are saying that he was really nice and sweet. And anytime mm -hmm. you take the time to meet with staff, you yes. take pictures. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's always so nice when you hear of someone who you admire as a star or celebrity yes. and then hear that they were so nice and yes. so friendly. Then that makes you like them even more. Even more, yeah. yeah. Well, put on your dancing shoes, ladies, and get ready to move. There is a new <laughs> dance craze, and it started right here in Central Florida. It's called the Before I Let Go Challenge, and it's even caught the attention of Beyonce. All new at 4.30, News 6's Amanda Castro <laughs> caught up with the local dancers behind the video that is now going viral. This is crazy. Honestly, I don't even know where to start. It all started a week ago after Beyonce's new Netflix documentary and live album dropped. Fred Barthel and Fabron Alexis were in the studio the next day, choreographing a dance to her remake of the song, Before I Let Go. It reminded me of the cha-cha slide, the electric slide type thing. So I just, you know, I was like, okay, she obviously wants us to jam along to this and create a dance, so I just went ahead and did it. 
posting their dance video on Instagram and Twitter, creating the hashtag Before I Let Go Challenge. Their moves gaining thousands of views over the next couple of days and inspiring others to participate in the challenge, even capturing the attention of the Queen Bee herself. Beyonce has 127 million followers. Never in this world would I have thought that she would even like dare see a video um, that I posted. But she did, and on Monday, Beyonce shared videos of the dance challenge on her Instagram story, highlighting the Orlando dancers first. She don't post on her story at all, so for us to even be on it, period, is, ah, it's just mind-blowing. As soon as I checked, my phone was going, bzz, 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 like, nonstop, and yeah, I almost fainted, pretty much. Like, it was crazy. She literally posted us and she acknowledged it and it was crazy. Now thousands of people are sharing their videos of the challenge on social media, many following their choreography. Barthel and Alexis even teaching me a few moves. Three. The dancers say Beyonce is their inspiration and they're still in shock, surprised and grateful for her support. She has no idea how much it's impacted me. Like I just want to follow my dreams even more. In Orlando, Amanda Castro getting results, News 6. Whoa, All whoa, right. whoa, 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 Amanda I know, I Castro. Did, did not see that coming. Look <laughs> oh at her. Gosh. Go, Amanda. She's going to have a baby Y'all think the Queen Wayne's secret saying she's very with child. And she's yes. Like, yes. I, I might have helped her out a little bit with some of those moves. Let's see your <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm good. My move is, is not trip on your way to video. Yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. That's the best thing I got going. <laughs> oh, my don't, God, you don't, scared don't, me. <laughs> don't fall. Don't fall. Hey, big storms are coming back. When I say big, I don't mean huge. I mean, there's a shot at rain coming in on Friday as a cold front approaches. For Thursday, rain chances are nil, zero. But by Friday, the cold front gets here. 60% chance of rain on your Friday, then down to 10% on Saturday. I, I know you get the picture. Friday's the day. Let me show you how we get there. Visible satellite image right now. Big ridge of high pressures in control. There's trouble brewing, though, across the... Gulf of Mexico. It will be on the way later. Temperature reading right now is 84 degrees in the city. Beautiful. And it is beautiful. Melbourne 80, Ocala 85. Wind from the southeast at 8. Temps where you live? Palm Coast 84, Titusville 81. In Melbourne 80 in southern Bavard County. Across the interior right now, Orlando's at 84. So is Kissimmee, Ocala. Warmer, 85. Sanford also one degree warmer at 85. Our normal daytime high this time of year is about 84. So we're crushing it. We're exactly the same spot right now that we were 24 hours ago, but five degrees warmer in New Smyrna Beach and four degrees warmer in Palm Coast. To radar, you see the sweep slowly moving through. There's just nothing to track. By Friday, all of that will change. Let me show you what's going on with the water vapor now. We're dry enough at the lower levels, but low level humidity is creeping back in. Look at this, from Houston up to Dallas, Big wraparound low coming in, pulling in that drier air down to South Texas. But from Dallas to Houston, it's raining and raining hard. That's the low. It's going to force the leading edge of the cold front right toward you as we make our way into Friday. Here's how it all happens. Tonight, no worries. And through the day tomorrow, not much to worry about either. This is 8 o'clock tonight. Broken cloud cover at worst. I think it's just totally clear tonight. Through the morning hours tomorrow, maybe a touch of fog. But by 5 p.m. tomorrow, more clouds show up. Let me stand over here. Now look, here's Friday morning at 8 a.m. So you, Marion County, Western Flagler, this is coming in from the north by northwest as the frontal zone elongates right on top of us. By 11 a.m., it's into Seminole County, downtown Orlando, and then it pushes through so that by 12, 31 o'clock, we're about done. By 4 p.m. on Friday, I think we've turned the corner. Lows tonight. 50s and 60s all over. The overnight low in the city, beautiful, is 60 with patchy fog late. Here is tomorrow. Your forecast brought to you by your Central Florida Honda dealers. It's all good stuff after the morning fog. By lunchtime tomorrow, 83. The daytime high, 88. Check out the week ahead. We'll hit a daytime high tomorrow of 88. The overnight low tomorrow night is 65. Come Friday, 84 with rain chances 60%. Saturday and Sunday, highs in the mid-80s with rain chances low. And then Monday, Tuesday of next week, mm. it's starting to look a whole lot more like May. Yeah. Okay. Really warm stuff and yeah. not a lot of rain yet. And it's almost May. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Tom. Tom. Get Pinpoint Weather on the go with our free News 6 Pinpoint Weather app. Our team keeps you up to date around the clock. Plus, use live interactive radar. Just search WKMG in your app store.
Well, if you haven't yet, make sure to check out our new podcast, Florida Foodie. Ginger's dancing again to this music. <laughs> it explores the big picture of food here in Florida. And this week, Candace Campos is talking with two groups looking to break a world record to get results for the health of people all across Central Florida. You can check it out on clickorlando.com slash podcast. I'm strumming a banjo because that's like what it, it. sounds like. Yes. Yeah, I do too. So to come, one school catching flack over its new dress code. Why one mom says she's so upset. Plus, credit card skimmers have gotten undetectable and the gas station crooks have gotten slicker. So deputies have too. Ahead of five, News 6's Eric Von Aken gets special access to the team getting crime results to protect you. You're watching News 6 at 430 getting results. We'll be right back. World Today. The hit reality show Survivor is looking for its next group of contestants. A casting call will be held this Sunday at Victory Casino Cruises in Cape Canaveral for anyone who thinks they have what it takes to outwit, outplay, and outlast. The casting call runs from 10 until 2. You can find eligibility requirements and forms at clickorlando.com. Just look for the link on the homepage. On your consumer watch, two drugstores are taking a stance against teen vaping by raising the tobacco buying age in their stores. Rite Aid and Walgreens announcing they both plan to raise the age to 21. Rite Aid says the change will be rolled out within the next three months. Walgreens saying their new policy will go into effect September 1st. CVS has already gotten rid of all tobacco products. Dress codes for students are expected. But one high school in Houston has set a dress code for parents. And not everyone is happy about it. The new parent dress code states parents cannot come on campus if they are wearing hair curlers. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> shower caps, pajamas, or certain styles of shorts or leggings. Some parents say they're insulted. Rosemary Young says she had to rush to the school for an emergency after her son broke his arm. Young was wearing a satin cap at the time, something that would not be appropriate. So it doesn't matter how a parent should come. If we come here belligerent, out of control, or things of that nature, this is what you have the police for. But what I wear should never be an issue. I'm not revealing. I'm not doing anything. I don't have any weapons. The school says the dress code is all about helping students by keeping the atmosphere dignified and free of distractions. I mean, you know I come to work every day with my hair in curlers. We see it. Yes. And there may come a day when I need to go pick up my child and... I'm going to have to show up in curlers. Henry's going to be so It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Ahead of five, we are staying on top of that breaking news. Troopers say a boy on a bike is hit and killed by a semi just blocks from his elementary school. We are live with the latest information. 2019 Edge. Live, getting results. This is News 6 at 5. Straight to breaking news off the top at 5. Sky 6 over the scene in Orlando along Weatherby Road and Landstar Boulevard. Troopers say a child was hit and killed by a semi about a half a mile from his school, Weatherby Elementary. News 6's Nikki Zizaza has been out there since 4. And Nikki, you just spoke with a parent who saw this all happen. Ladies, I did within the last half hour. I have new details about that crash that happened here at the intersection of Landstar and Weatherby. If you take a look behind me, you will see the bicycle and the backpack that the witness who saw this crash happen says the child was traveling on. Now, that witness just moments ago said he was picking his child up from Weatherby Elementary School when he witness the truck making a turn here on Landstar Boulevard, striking the child. He said that it was pretty horrifying and he pulled over. His son yelled out that he thinks that the truck struck the child. Now, what we know right now is the juvenile was traveling on a bicycle when he was struck by the child making a t crossing the street here on Landstar Boulevard. Officials with FHP holding back on classifying this as a hit and run. And that minor was transported to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital, where the juvenile was pronounced dead. Now, that witness who saw this all happen decided to stay here at the scene. Take a listen to what he had to say. I was looking at the crossing guard, and I looked, my son said, Daddy, that, that truck just ran over the little boy. And when I looked, I seen the back part of the truck running over the little boy. And I was like, 
Did we just witness a little boy get hit? Now, FHP investigators are still on scene here collecting evidence, but that witness we spoke to says he doesn't believe the truck driver was even aware that he struck the child. All he could tell us about the description on this truck was that it was white and it had red lettering on the back. Now, we are continuing to get more information about this, and as soon as we find out more, we'll be sure to keep you updated on air and online at clickorlando.com. For now, I'm live in Orlando, Nikki Zizaza getting results, News 6. Just a tragic tragedy. Tragic, tragic, tragic story, Nikki. Thank you. Also breaking now at five, a home taped off with crime scene tape as Cocoa Beach police investigate in a backyard. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ginger Gadsden. And I'm Lisa Bell. Matt Austin is on assignment, and we will hear from him coming up in a minute. But first, police have responded to a home near 4th Street and Woodland Boulevard. That's just blocks from A1A. New 6's James Barbero is live at the scene tonight. And James, you just spoke with the police sergeant. What is he telling you about this? Some new information, Lisa, that there possibly could be a body buried in this backyard here at the corner of Woodland and Forth. Back there right now, there's a Cocoa Beach police officer. He's operating an excavator, and deputies with the Brevard Sheriff's Office crime scene team, they are assisting. I'll do this as smooth as I can so you can get a closer look. There's cameras above the scene. There's hundreds of neighbors seemingly out. There's that excavator right there. He's making his way away from where they've been focusing their attention. That's right back there. You see there's a barrier that the Sheriff's Office put up to obstruct our view. But new in the past half hour, we've learned from the Brevard Sheriff's Office, this is the possibility of a body buried in this backyard. The home is vacant. We hear that no one's lived here for at least a year. And the Sheriff's Office tells us that this body might be a person who's been buried or deceased for a long time. We were told it could be many years. But we don't have further details than that right now. We don't know if it's a man or a woman, if it's an adult or a child. But we continue to keep our eyes on this situation developing situation here in a neighborhood that never sees activity like this. We're close to downtown Cocoa Beach. It's got the attention of everyone in the neighborhood. We've got more reports coming up tonight at 6 o'clock and then even on our evening editions of News 6. So we're going to keep you posted with any more that we find out. Live in Cocoa Beach, I'm James Sparvero getting results News 6. Back to you. All right, James, thank you. We have a guy here that just shot the pharmacy counter with a rifle. He has a gun. Now at five, frantic 911 calls released after an armed man storms a Walgreens pharmacy. He was eventually shot by Daytona Beach police, and this afternoon he faced a judge for the first time. Lewis Curler stood quiet in a Volusia County courtroom today. He is accused of walking into the Walgreens yesterday near West International Speedway Boulevard. Police say he was armed with a rifle and demanding drugs. New 6's Lauren Korn is live at the Daytona Beach Jail where Curler is being held. And Lauren Curler's attorney requested he get bond, but that was denied. Yes, the judge was quick to deny his bond. And today we're learning more about where this man came from. We have a guy here that just shot the pharmacy counter with a rifle. He has a gun. Panic inside Walgreens on Tuesday after police say 41-year-old Lewis Curler approached the pharmacy counter armed with a rifle. Employees telling 911 he first paced the floor asking for drugs. He's like, can you guys give me some drugs? Like after the, he had been hanging out for a few minutes, I was like, no, no, I don't have a prescription. And it escalated from there. I, I gotta go, honey, I gotta protect these people. Yes, get everybody out of the store, okay? Police say Curler then injected the narcotics as police raced to the counter. They say that's when he stood up with the rifle pointed in their direction. Police firing one shot, striking Curler in the lower buttocks area. He was telling us that he felt like people were out to get him. Investigators tell News 6 Curler was just hospitalized at Halifax Health Medical Center a day or two prior, but say it's unclear for how long. You don't have to speak to me at all today if you don't want to do so. Curler faced a judge today and did not say a word as his public defender argued for a bond. The state wanted Curler to face additional charges, but the judge declined to rule on that motion at this time. He's being held without bond. Police are working with ATF to figure out how he got a hold of the gun, but they say it was not reported stolen. Uh, we called Walgreens corporate office for a comment about safeguards in the stores, and we just got a response back, and it says, in part, we are committed to providing a safe environment for our customers and employees and have a number of different security measures in place throughout the stores, although they did not go into detail on what those security measures are. Ginger? 
All right, Lauren Korn reporting live. Lauren, thank you. And you can listen to the 911 calls and watch the surveillance video from inside the Walgreens store right now on ClickOrlando.com. Just look in the story. It's on the homepage. Now to the new developments and New Six's mission to drive change. A bill aimed at cracking down on distracted driving was postponed today in the Florida Senate. It comes one day after the House passed a bill that would make texting and driving a primary offense. News 6 anchor Matt Austin is in Tallahassee again tonight. And Matt, why was there a delay on the vote today? So here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing there are people in the Senate who really don't like this House bill. I'm hearing there are people in the House who really don't like the Senate bill. So yesterday, the House quickly voted, sent their bill over to the Senate, putting all the pressure on the Senate side. And today, the Senate, as you said, postponed their vote on that bill. And while we wait, the people left in the middle are those who have lost someone to a texting driver. On the steps of the old Capitol, advocates for driving safety urge lawmakers to finally make texting and driving a primary offense. She was having an argument with her boyfriend on the phone and she took her eyes off the road and hit my daughter head on. Many, like Steve Augello, have lost loved ones. His daughter, Alessandra, was killed by a texting driver. It happened in seconds. I've been coming here a long time to talk about my daughter, Alessandra. I don't want to keep coming back. It's getting old now. We really need this law. But the urgency outside the Capitol was met with more delay inside. The Senate, set to vote on the issue, decided to temporarily postpone it, as their bill still does not match the House version. Do you, th do you feel like the Senate is open to the House's bill, or? You know, this is the process. So, um, you know, if we're not open to it, then, um, you know, that's how things don't get done. And um, so I would say we're, we're open to suggestions and ideas. We don't have any pride of authorship on these things. It, what that bill's about is saving lives. So the question is, will we end up with a law that looks like the House's bill or a law that looks like the Senate's bill? Maybe something in between. One thing we do know is that if they can't come to a compromise, we will end up in the same place we have for several years now with nothing. Ladies, live from Tallahassee, I'm Matt Austin, News 6, getting results. And nobody wants that deja vu all that over again, That would be a shame. Matt. Yeah, let's hope something good happens. Thanks, Matt. Well, a popular children's toy now getting results for the visually impaired. What one company created straight ahead. Also, a lumberyard mystery, a sheriff's deputy finding a prosthetic leg. Whose was it and how did it get there, Tom? That's weird. Hey, take a look at what's going on in the weather. This isn't weird. This is beautiful. High pressure here, big low building there. That is coming to see you. I'll be right back to pinpoint the arrival of the rain in minutes. First, though, investigators say it all starts with a swipe. Your personal information transmitted and copied. I'd venture to say we probably find two or three uh, at least a week. Only on 6, the undercover investigation with detectives. What we discovered, gas station skimmers are already doing with your information and money. That's all new at 5. You're watching News 6 at 5, getting results. We'll be right back. This portion of the news is sponsored by Subway. Now through April 30th. I'm News 6 meteorologist Candace Campos. It's feeling like another summer-like day for tomorrow. Get out there and enjoy it. If you have the chance to head out to the beach, it's going to be a pretty nice weather day. 85 degrees will be our temperature. The water temperature warming up to about 75 degrees. Rip current risk does go up to about a moderate range. Our next high tide by tomorrow afternoon between about 120 and 111 along the coastline. Get out there and enjoy before the storms roll in on Friday. Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells will have more coming up in minutes. Live with Matt Austin, Lisa Bell, weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells, Meteorologist Candace Campos, special reports from the investigators, and getting crime results with Eric Von Enken. This is News 6 at 5, getting results.
Only on 6 tonight, an eye-opening look at credit card skimmers. They are showing up almost every day across Brevard County, but you cannot tell that they're there. Yeah, and the worst part, you don't know your card has been compromised until it's too late. Deputies are now out to stop these skimmers before you become the target. News 6's Eric Von Anken got an inside look at how the special unit at the sheriff's office is getting crime results. And Eric, this is something that impacts most of us. Ginger, I had no idea how good the crook have gotten at stealing credit cards, how slick the new technology is, and how big this skimming ring, it's actually a ring, really is. I found out the bad guys now use wireless Bluetooth to transmit credit card numbers from their skimmer inside the pump to their computers inside their cars. This time, Agent Justin Wood and his tech expert teammate do not find a skimmer, but this isn't the norm because good. usually they do. We go out probably uh, two to three times a week, and I'd venture to say we probably find two or three uh, at least a week. All day all over Brevard County, skimmers are collecting your credit card information. Every time you swipe and you have no way of knowing because skimmers are now so small and so sophisticated, they're slyly installed inside a pump in seconds. This is inside and this can't be seen. There's no way to detect this from the outside though. Unfortunately, no, it's nothing you'd be able to see, touch, feel, or look at. Each skimmer that Agent Wood finds spawns an intensive investigation for his economic crimes unit here at the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. First, they download the data on the skimmer's tiny computer chip and contact the banks and credit card companies to find out where the stolen numbers are being used. And then I obtained video which shows this vehicle using a card that came off of that skimmer and they purchased diesel fuel. Agent Wood and the team discovered the skimming is only the first phase of a much larger gas stealing organized operation. Here's how it works. Someone steals your account info. Someone else makes a new card with it and turns gift cards into working stolen credit cards to buy diesel fuel to sell on the black market. You can see it looks like it's a, it's a stack of wood. Thieves use cleverly disguised bladder trucks like this fake facade of plywood that was hiding a 700 gallon tank. Within the past two years, we've actually arrested um, and made great cases on 14 different uh, fuel bladder vehicles. 14. 14 that were using the stolen credit card information from skimming devices, using that to purchase diesel fuel. Maybe you're asking, how does someone sell stolen diesel fuel? They sell it to Shady Fuel Yards. One was just busted in South Florida. Who sell to contractor fleets or big rigs who buy it for a deeply discounted price? So if you can't see a skimmer, what do you do to protect yourself? Well, always use a credit card, not a debit card. Pay with cash, or if you can't, then the answer is go inside, hmm. ladies, and pay. Yeah. We'll put all that on clickorlando.com. Oh, my. It, it is so elaborate. If only they would use that power for good and do something really good with that. Okay, think. so I always check for the little strip. I shake right. it, and then I see the little key. How are these guys getting in there to put those skimmers in? That blew me away, too, Ginger. It's a joke. You can buy the keys on eBay. What? Uh. All the keys are all over the Internet. Oh. So these, these crooks buy the keys, and then they go into the pump, and then they have... The stickers, they carry the stickers with them and they stick them on when they're done. You know what I suggested was put a lock, put a padlock yes. on some of these older pumps. They do in some cases, but not everybody. Wow. <laughs> my it's job maddening. is on the desk know, it's right awful. now. It's maddening. Oh my gosh. Eric, excellent. Thank you. Sure. All right, we do want to take a live look now outside. This is going to be Orlando. I just heard from our producer. There is, <laughs> and there it is. Lake Eola. It's pretty gorgeous out there. Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrell standing by. And it was a little toasty, but we liked it, Tom. Oh, I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Ginger's giving me side eye. You liked it? I like it for August. Oh, wow. No, in <laughs> August, it'll be 90. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know. I Take know. a look at what's going on tomorrow. And Port Orange over in Volusia County. The temperature reading at 8 a.m. will be 62 by noon tomorrow, 80. And yes, we will be above average. The daytime high tomorrow goes back to about 86 degrees. Then in Bavard County in Rockledge, 62 degrees at 8 a.m. By noon tomorrow in Rockledge, 81. Your 3 o'clock temperature makes it to 84. And then by 6 p.m. tomorrow evening, we're back down to 82. Important thing to note, a lot of sunshine in that forecast. No rain coming until Friday. Here's your rainmaker.
Back out here from Dallas down to Houston. Big low cranking this way is going to sail a cold front right across the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if the low came in here, things would really rock. But the low is going to drift farther to the north and just drive the front end. So I think we're going to be okay on Friday, just active. Probably not as active as last Friday, but still, some rain showers are coming your way. I'll show you in just a moment. As this ridge of high pressure gives way, everything changes. Daytime high today about 85 to 88. The overnight low this morning was 60. Normal is 84, so at least we beat the normal. You knew that was coming. Daytona Beach at news time is at 80 degrees. Wind from the east-southeast at 8 miles per hour. Right now at Orlando Health Camera, looking in the heart of downtown, we are at 85 with winds from the east at 6. Temps where you live. Well, Gainesville is super warm. 87 degrees up there in Lashua County, 78 in Melbourne, 78 Cocoa Beach, 80 Daytona Beach, 82 Flagler County and Palm Coast. Radar, I wouldn't go so far as say it's worthless, but it's not picking up anything. Here's the water vapor loop, and there's the abundant moisture. The big low building through Texas and Oklahoma, rolling to the northeast while we sit here with just great weather. Tonight, the good stuff continues. First thing in the morning, some fog, and through the day tomorrow, no worries. But watch this, on Friday... Friday morning, 8 o'clock from Flagler County all the way to Marion County. It comes racing in by 11 a.m. It's into Orlando, but by 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5, starting to get on down to the south and out. Lows tonight, 50s and 60s all over, calling the low in Orlando 60. Here's tomorrow. Your forecast brought to you by Napleton Chrysler Jeep Dodge. It's hot again. What else can I tell you? 88's the high. Check out the week ahead. We go to a daytime high tomorrow of 88 degrees. No rain chance until Friday. Friday's high 84 with the showers getting into Orlando by noon. All right, Tom. Thank you. You bet. Well, ready for takeoff. Why drone delivery is one step closer to reality. And new at 530, lots of damage left behind at a car dealership. How investigators are working to track down the crooks behind it all. Same alert, different direction. Southbound Florida Turnpike will be closed tonight from around 10 o'clock till about 5 in the morning. Right around 528 Consulate Exit, where you can head to US 441. You're going to force you to US 441 from there. You can take that south to Osceola Parkway and then reconnect to the Turnpike. Also on 528 from about mile marker 1 till about 4, which is I-4 all the way over to John Young Parkway. Expect some intermediate lane closures both east and westbound on the 528. I'm Trooper Steve with your new 6 traffic alert. I'll catch you in the morning. New at 5, a man wanted out of Jacksonville is caught in Seminole County. Helicopter video shows the moment he darts from deputies after causing... He's working his way across I-4 now. There's a deputy. Uh, deputy's going to be out with him. And still going to be foot pursuit underneath I-4 coming back towards you. Deputies were trying to catch 28-year-old Randolph Moses. He was wanted in Duval County on burglary and battery charges. Seminole County deputies eventually caught him in a ditch along I-4 near Samford. He's now in the Seminole County Jail facing a list of new charges. Drone delivery may be closer to reality. The Federal Aviation Authority just gave the green light to Google's Wing Aviation. This video posted on the company's website shows the drone test. This is the first time a company has received a federal air carrier certification. To get to this point, Wing demonstrated positive results in parts of Australia. The company performed 70,000 test flights and made 3,000 deliveries. Wing says it plans to roll out the service in Virginia later this year. Other companies like Amazon, UPS and DHL are working on similar tests. Lego is getting results for the blind and visually impaired. This afternoon, the company announced Braille Bricks. Lego says the new brick set will be used as a new teaching tool for schools or parents with kids with disabilities. Each brick has studs that represent a letter, number, or character. Lego says the sets will help kids develop the skills needed to thrive in a fast-paced world. And kudos to them idea. for that. Yes, long time overdue, but I know that's going to be uh, such a gift for so many people. Of course, everyone loves Legos. Yeah. Well, a lost prosthetic leg found. A sheriff in Texas got results, returning it to the amputee who lost it. A Sonoma County Sheriff found the leg out on patrol in a lumber yard. After some investigating, turns out the leg belonged to a skydiver who lost it just days ago. The sheriff contacted the skydiving place and pinpointed who this guy was. Turns out that man was Dion Calloway. The two met a couple of days ago for the leg to be returned. The sheriff's office says Dion was very thankful and plans on getting back to 
the sky again. Well, glad they were able to reunite yes. them. Well, yeah. they are not cheap. That's the thing. Correct. Mm -hmm. Here's a look at what's coming up at 530. Hurricane season is getting closer and communities want to be prepared for the worst. Find out what one city is doing to prevent a repeat of the damage it saw two years ago. And we are following breaking news after an hours long hearing for an accused killer. Learn more about the ruling a judge handed down just about an hour and a half ago. Total savings on edge. Live, getting results. This is News 6 at 5.30. Now at 5.30, crooks target luxury vehicles causing a lot of damage at a dealership. See how deputies are working to get crime results and catch the thieves. First, though, we are following several breaking news stories tonight. First, a young boy is dead. Troopers say he was hit by a semi at the intersection of Weatherby Road and Landstar Boulevard. Sky 6 was over the scene. Weatherby Elementary is not far from this intersection, and we just learned about 40 minutes ago that is where the little boy went to school. Investigators tell us the boy was on a bicycle when he was hit around 2.30 this afternoon. Troopers are looking for the driver of the semi, but they are not calling this a hit and run yet because it's not even clear whether that driver is even aware of what happened. We have a crew at the scene, and we'll bring you a live update on News 6 at 6, and you can always find the latest on ClickOrlando.com. Also, police are digging up a yard at a home in Cocoa Beach. Investigators say they received a tip that a body may be buried in the yard of a home along Woodland Avenue near 4th Street. Police say the body may have been there for years, but have not said if they have found it yet. We are expecting another live update coming up at 6. Another breaking story tonight. An accused killer is competent to stand trial, according to a judge. Glad you're with us. I'm Ginger Gadsden. And I'm Lisa Bell. Matt Austin is on assignment. That competency hearing was initially delayed when that man refused to appear in court this morning. He is accused of abducting and killing a woman from Seminole County in 2017. His defense has argued since last year that he is not competent to face the charges against him in court. News 6 is Nadine Giannis is following today's hearing, which wrapped up just a short time ago. And Nadine, what did the judge have to say when he made his ruling? Well, Lisa, Scott Nelson himself seemed to agree to disagree with his defense attorneys in a letter to that judge just last month saying, quote, everyone everywhere knows Scott Nelson is competent and a judge agreed today. Take a look at this uh, video from trial today. Now, Scott Nelson, like you said, was brought into court, even though he refused to do so, appearing in court 90 minutes after the scheduled competency hearing. He's accused of kidnapping and stabbing and killing Winter Park caretaker Jennifer Fulford back in 2017. Now, today, he seemingly disagreed with even having this competency hearing, but the defense still called a, psychiat a psychiatric doctor, George Woods, who via video conference testified Nelson has a brain injury. He has a bad cognitive thinking and suffers from bipolar disorder. The state, though, brought in their own witness, this time a clinical psychologist who has said he's done more than 4,000 competency hearings and said after reviewing Nelson himself, that he was indeed competent, adding even his calm demeanor in court today shows that he is. The judge agreed, and Jennifer Fulford's family, her oldest sister, seemingly happy once the decision came down. It's hard to celebrate <laughs> right now. We're done with the day. Did you tired. feel like he was confident? You know, I think he probably is, but I don't know. Thank I'm, you very I much. I just can't see anything else. And um, Jennifer Fulford's brother-in-law, who was with her sister Kathy there, said that uh, they are no longer mad at Scout Nelson, but they are still angry at what they say he did and what prosecutors say he did. At the end of the hearing today, Scott Nelson also raised his hand, seemingly still trying to talk to the judge on his own. He tried to hand the judge a note, and uh, he said that he wants his trial to start soon, and tomorrow morning they will set a trial date. Guys, back to you. Nadine Giannis reporting live for us. Thank you. News 6 has been following this case since the victim first went missing. You can find all of our coverage on the investigation and the arrest of Scott Nelson. It's at clickorlando.com. Now to a crime alert. Car thieves caught a lot, caused a lot of damage to a dealership selling luxury vehicles. News 6's James Barvero shows us how deputies are working to get crime results and catch the crooks. On a major road that's lined with car dealerships, the Brevard Sheriff's Office says these crooks struck fast and they got away with three vehicles. The gate on each side of the business looks like it was crashed through. 
How deputies say multiple thieves got away. Four o'clock this morning at Island Lincoln on 520. It's believed the car burglars jumped the fence, smashed the windows of a few Lincolns, and were somehow able to get them started and drive away. Three other vehicles have been actually stolen from the business, and probably about six or so have been damaged in some form. Glass shattered everywhere. You can even see car keys on the lot. I have that smashed lock box for the vehicle keys up here on the lot. The sheriff's office says no one saw it. The theft's not discovered until a paper deliverer got to the dealer. But they're there for as short a period of time as possible to get what they need and get out. Deputies checking if the thieves were captured on surveillance. Investigators are also calling other law enforcement agencies in Central Florida to check if other car thefts might be connected. It could be somebody wanting to move a vehicle that's an expensive vehicle, or it could be somebody just wants to ride around in one. That's what the investigators are trying to determine. And this is an active investigation, so anyone who has any information about what happened this morning at the dealership is asked to call the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. In Merritt Island, I'm James Sparvero, getting results News 6. An inmate is back behind bars after investigators say he briefly escaped from deputies while still wearing handcuffs. This is a mugshot of Teddy King from earlier this year. Sheriff's Office says King was brought to Melbourne Regional Hospital after complaining of chest pains and made his escape when he was being taken back to a transport van to return to jail. Our news partners at Florida Today shot this video of the search near Wickham Road. King was on the run for about 40 minutes before he was caught. Deputies say he was already facing several burglary charges and is now facing additional charges for this escape attempt. A man accused of killing three members of his family wants to be released from jail while he awaits his trial. Grant Amato is due in court tomorrow for a bond hearing. Amato's mom, dad and brother were all found dead at their Chulioda home in January. Investigators say Amato shot them to death say after Amato stealing $200,000 to give to a woman in Bulgaria he met online. The state plans to seek the death penalty should Amato be convicted. A teen boy is in the hospital after a shooting and two people are facing charges. Orange County deputies tell News 6 the 17-year-old was shot in the head during a fight on South 5th Street in Bithlow. Deputies say the two people facing charges were trying to get their daughter, who was with the victim, and did not come home after school. Anita Rios and Pedro Mendez Santiago claim they felt threatened, so they fired their guns as warning shots. However, investigators say their accounts of what happened differ from one another, but did not say how. Deputies say they found two guns inside the couple's car. They are now facing aggravated assault charges. A police officer is back on the job today following an investigation into accusations of child abuse. So veto officer Joseph Meyer was subjected to an administrative inquiry, which concluded the accusations were not sustained. That means there was not enough evidence to prove or disprove the accusations. Meyer was arrested in August of last year, but the state attorney dismissed all charges against the officer in November. Following Sunday's terror attack in Sri Lanka, there is concern more suicide bombings could be coming. New security video shows two suspected suicide bombers inside one of the luxury hotels blown up on Easter Sunday. Police say the men were brothers and sons of a wealthy local businessman who is now in custody along with more than 50 others. ISIS released this video claiming responsibility for the coordinated attacks. There are still talks of, uh, you know, that, you know, some of these suicide bombers might be roaming around. Some Muslims are now leaving their homes fearing revenge attacks. CBS Elizabeth Palmer is in Sri Lanka right now. She'll show the growing concern among the Muslim community there coming up on the CBS Evening News after News 6 at 6. Well, now a traffic alert along I-4. Road crews are getting ready to open up the seventh new ramp in Maitland since the start of the I-4 Ultimate Project. For this one, FDOT will be permanently closing the surface street between Keller and Lake Destiny. That means drivers on eastbound Maitland Boulevard will be seeing something different when getting onto westbound I-4. So as you're heading towards I-4, you'll need to get up into those elevated lanes and then pair off to the right onto a new permanent ramp. We're told it will be another six months to a year before all of the work from the I-4 Ultimate Project is done in Maitland. This new on-ramp to I-4 Westbound is scheduled to open first thing Friday morning. And you can learn about all of the work involved in the I-4 Ultimate Project right now at clickorlando.com slash traffic. And we will have live traffic reports Friday morning right here on News 6 to help you get around the new traffic pattern and any other problems on the road. 
The scars from Hurricane Irma can still be seen around our area. Yeah, and one community wants to prevent damage like that from happening again. Crews are working right now to protect properties ahead of this year's hurricane season. We'll explain what they hope to do should our area get hit again. Tom. The beautiful weather continued today, but look out there. There's trouble brewing on the horizon. I'll pinpoint the arrival of the cold front and when the rain kicks back in. You're watching News 6 at 5.30, getting results. We'll be right back. Florida Hospital is now Advent Health. The same doctors you know, the same care you trust. Caring for your body, mind, and spirit. Live with Matt Austin, Ginger Gadsden, Weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. This is New 6 at 530, getting results. The price of treating diabetes in the United States is on the rise. A new report shows many of the 7 million people who rely on insulin to lower their blood sugar are struggling to pay for it. A congressional committee from Maryland looked into prices of medication in the U.S. and compared it to other countries. It found the cost is 92% lower in Australia and 82% lower in the U.K. They say that's in part because Medicare is not allowed to negotiate directly with drug makers. The hefty prices have led some patients to skip or even ration their medication. They will tell me that they're not buying the insulin because they need to buy their food. Drug makers blame the troubled health care system plus the cost of innovation. Some companies have made moves to lower prices, but frustrated lawmakers say it's a life and death problem that needs a better cure. The current measles outbreak just hit record numbers. According to data from states and local health departments, there are currently 681 cases of the measles now reported in 22 states, and that includes here in Florida. That is the highest number of cases since the disease was declared eliminated in the U.S. in the year 2000. Prior to this outbreak, the highest number of cases was 667 in 2014. Doctors say the MMR vaccine is the best defense against the potential deadly disease. They encourage all parents to get their children vaccinated on schedule. Hurricane Irma caused significant damage to parts of our area in 2017 and with another hurricane season now approaching, communities are preparing for the worst. Castleberry leaders want to protect people's property from creeks jumping their banks like they did two years ago. News 6's Clay Lepard shows us the work being done in Seminole County. This is Chris Fournier's home. And this is what's left of their backyard after city leaders say they had to do something because G Creek was eroding the ground so much that there was a fear this home could wash away. It doesn't look intimidating, but G Creek here in Castlebury can swell up like it did in 2017 after Hurricane Irma when much of the county was dealing with flooding issues. It's uh, eroded a lot. This backyard is one of several spots in Castlebury getting an upgrade. And so now there is, of course, no nowhere to mow down there anymore. About 15 feet of it has disappeared from erosion since Fournier and her family moved in 42 years ago. Our house is paid for, so it's like, you know, it's our investment. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to see it floating down the creek, you know. Over time, these, these two backyards just keep slowly eroding into this major creek. A million dollars through a federal grant means these rock-filled wire cages can go in and protect against future erosion. Several square miles drains right here. So uh, when we get when we get a big, big storm event like Irma, um, it makes a big difference on this creek. It's all being put in place before hurricane season starts back up in June. It, it would be more eroded. I mean, I'd probably lose probably 10 more feet. That was our goal to try to get things done before we're hit by another hurricane season. This is a major uh, drainage conveyance for the city of Castleberry and there are a lot of vulnerable homes along the way. And in Castleberry, Clay Lapard getting results, News 6. Yeah, uh, Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells joins us now. Hi. And clearly that has to be top of mind for a lot of people, especially considering what we saw two years ago. Yeah, yeah, we lucked out last year. Mm -hmm. We lucked out. Our state did not luck no. out. Can you imagine if Michael had come through here, what it no. would have been like? So, you know, you never know. And the thing that makes it a hurricane season, a bad one or a good one, is if you get hit. One. Only Just takes one, one storm. All it takes. So we'll see what happens as we get closer to the season. We're all diligently working on the big hurricane special. It's going to air on May 31st. Looking Just forward to it. Yeah. All right. Hey, take a look at what's going on tonight. Tonight, mild, patchy fog, late night. Most of that would be to the north of Orlando. I don't think most of you have any worries at all. During the day tomorrow, we will be dry, but we will be hot. Daytime high tomorrow getting closer to 88. Some of you might even touch 90.
before the next two days are over. Come Friday, scattered storms return. And by scattered, I mean, well, fairly prominent. You'll see the hour by hour breakup. But by lunchtime on Friday, we should have something to pinpoint and to track. It's all because of this low building out here in Texas and Oklahoma. Much of the energy is going this way, but the swing around cold front's going to march over. The reason it's not coming straight over on top of us right now is because our ridge of high pressure is still firmly in place and in control. As long as that high stays there, nothing changes, nothing moves. Look on the back side of the high, things are good. 80 in Miami, 82 in Atlanta, 62 as far north as Columbus. Even Detroit made it to 60 today. 71 right now in Minneapolis and 73 in Bismarck. It's hot in a lot of the country right now. Daytona Beach looks great. 80 degrees in Daytona Beach with wind from the east southeast at 8. Where you live, temps are kind of all over the board. Depends on how close you are to the water and where the wind's coming from. All over Bavard County, we're in the upper 70s, so life's good. 78 in Melbourne. But look up there in Gainesville, burning up. 87 degrees in Gainesville, that's about 6 or 7 degrees above the norm for the daytime high. Temperature change right now, we're 1 degree warmer in Orlando than we were yesterday at the same time. And radar tonight, all is good. There's nothing to pinpoint on radar until Friday. Here's the water vapor loop. You see the moisture building there from Dallas down to Houston. That's on the way for you, but not again, not until Friday. Tonight, we do really well. There may be some patchy fog tomorrow morning, but no real problems through the day tomorrow. All is good. If you have outdoor plans, have at it. But by Friday, here comes our frontal boundary. Big rain into Ocala by 9 a.m. into Sumter County right after that, all the way through into Orlando and Kissimmee by noon, and then into the afternoon, much of the big rain is over. It's time for the weekend. Lows tonight, 50s and 60s, calling it 60 in Orlando. Here's tomorrow. Your forecast brought to you by Hudson's Furniture. Touch of fog early on, then just heat. The high tomorrow is 88. Check out the week ahead. We will hit 88 for your daytime high tomorrow, the low 65. Friday is the stormy day. By lunchtime, the rain's in Orlando. Calming for Saturday and Sunday and much of next week. Looks great. All right, Tom, thank you. Well, this Sunday is your chance to be the next reality TV star. The hit show Survivor, you may have heard of it, is looking for its next group of castaways. A casting call will be held this weekend at Victory Casino Cruises in Cape Canaveral. For anyone who thinks they have what it takes to outwit, outplay, and outlast, the casting call runs from 10 until 2. To read about eligibility requirements and fill out the forms you need, just head to clickorlando.com and look for the link. It's right on the homepage. A pair of elementary school students getting results for the safety of their classmates. Their goal, getting cars to slow down near a crosswalk. And they are making it happen with a unique approach, an optical illusion. Find out what it took to make this project a reality. Plus, a new viral challenge championed by Beyonce has a Central Florida connection. Post on Instagram first and then we put on Twitter. And then Twitter started getting more. Honestly, it just blew up overnight and it was crazy. Mind blown. Ahead at six, we'll introduce you to the Orlando dancers who credited the Before I Let Go Challenge. Today in the morning news, we told you about an expanded recall involving ground beef sold right here in Central Florida. Coming up tomorrow, a new push to get results for children. The county holding a community event aimed at keeping kids safe near water. You gotta watch before you go. We'll see you in the morning starting at five. Be sure to download Florida's Fourth Estate from wherever you like to get your podcast. It's available on Stitcher, Google Play, and Apple. You can also find videos of all of our podcasts on clickorlando.com slash podcasts. Well, we have some pretty unique road configurations here in Central Florida, each with its own set of rules. One left a New 6 viewer scratching her head, so New 6 traffic safety expert Trooper Steve Montiero is clearing up the confusion in this week's Ride Along. We see a lot of craziness here in Central Florida, especially when it comes to traffic. So Steve and Jane reached out talking about the traffic configuration out here at Ileana Street and Wadesworth Avenue. This is the first time I've seen a configuration like this pretty much anywhere. When traveling north and south on Wadesworth Avenue, just south of Ileana Street, you'll find what I'm calling an alternating traffic pattern. The key to this is zero distractions and first to stop, 
first to go. When traveling either north or south on Wadesworth Avenue, you will see a sign under the stop sign indicating that you have to stop to oncoming traffic. This sign is informing you that if traffic is already coming at you, then you're required to wait. Same would apply for you if you've already possessed the travel lane and proceeded past the stop sign. Although this seems like a mess, if you just take a second, breathe, relax, this is as simple as it comes. Basic stop sign rules apply and you'll be able to travel right through this. Ride Along with Trooper Steve is sponsored by Alert Today Florida. Every pedestrian and bicyclist is important to someone, so stay alert because safety doesn't happen by accident. If you want to ride along with Trooper Steve, go to clickorlando.com slash ride along. A pair of students is trying something unique to get results for the safety of their classmates. Take a look at this. The two students recently got a new crosswalk painted near their school in Medford, Massachusetts. The crosswalk is painted to look three-dimensional. The goal is to make drivers think there is something in the road so they slow down at the intersection. We were thinking of a way we could do something to help make our streets safer. When you're walking across, you can tell that it's painted. But what we hope is when you're driving down, you'll see it as like 3D, three-dimensional. So it looks real. I kind of like this. I do too. The kids are part of the Center for Citizenship and Organization that works to get kids involved in local government. It took the students a year of working with the city to get the project green lit. It makes it does something to your eyes, so you have yes. to pay extra attention yes. to it. I really oh like it. You gosh. don't want it to be too distracting no. for drivers, but you want them to know something. That gets there. the point across. Well, a massive <laughs> artistic undertaking is honoring a famous figure of the Renaissance. Yeah, an Italian artist is marking the five hundred anniversary of the death of Leonardo da Vinci. He is doing this by using a tractor to create a giant portrait of the artist and inventor. It took eight hours to complete the work, plowing lines and curves for the massive work of art. And when I say massive, it is massive. The portrait measures 10 square miles across an expanse of farmland in Verona. Despite all this hard work, this work of art will not last. Look at that. That's beautiful. That is very oh my gosh. incredible. The yes. image will be plowed over after a few days so the land can be cultivated for crops. At first, when we were looking at it, it didn't even seem like we were looking at a field, yeah. like we yeah. were looking at a real painting. It's very cool. Wow. All right, so here's what we're working on for News 6 at 6. Caught on camera, a wild chase through busy afternoon traffic. What deputies say this man did that led to di this dangerous pursuit. And breaking in the past 30 minutes, we just learned new information about a police investigation behind a home. A live report from Cocoa Beach. MC.com. Live, getting results. This is News 6 at 6. Breaking in just the past 30 minutes, we just learned new information about the 10-year-old boy hit and killed by a semi-truck. Troopers say he was a student at Weatherby Elementary School in Orlando. And right now, troopers are searching for the semi that hit and killed the little boy. We know that grief counselors will be on campus tomorrow. The crash happened around 2.30 this afternoon, less than half a mile from Weatherby Elementary at Weatherby Road and Landstar Boulevard. And that is where News 6 reporter Nikki Zizaza joins us now live. And Nikki, I know you spoke with a man who saw this all happen this afternoon. That's right, ladies. A witness says he had just picked up his son from school when he witnessed this terrifying crash. He says he saw a semi truck crash into a 10 year old boy on his bicycle here at the intersection of Landstar and Weatherby. Now, Florida Highway Patrol officials just gave us new details and say it happened around 2.30 p.m. And moments later, Sky 6 was getting a view from above. A witness and Florida Highway Patrol say the 10 year old who attended Weatherby Elementary was traveling on a bicycle and apparently crossing Landstar Boulevard when a semi truck traveling southbound on a green light crashed into the child who had the right of way. FHP investigators say it is still not clear whether the driver of the semi truck was aware a collision occurred while making a turn onto Landstar Avenue because of the size of the truck and the possibility the impact wasn't felt. Officials with FHP say because that they are not classifying this as a hit and run. The boy was transported to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital where the juvenile was pronounced dead. Now that witness we spoke to a short time ago had this to say. My son said, Daddy, that, that truck just ran over the little boy. And when I looked, I seen the back part of the truck 
running over the little boy. And I was like, did we just witness a little boy get hit? Now, FHP investigators, as you can see, are still on scene here trying to get a clearer picture of what may have happened. And we were told that they are talking to area businesses here about what someone, anyone, what they may have seen happen here around 2.30 p.m. What we know is that semi-truck was white and may have had red lettering. Now, we will continue to follow this story as more information becomes available. For now, I'm live in Orlando, Nikki Zizaza, getting results, News 6. Nikki, thank you. We first told you about this breaking news just before Ford today. Be sure to download the News 6 app and enable push alerts so we can let you know anytime breaking news happens in your area. We are continuing to follow another breaking news alert. Police are wrapping up their investigation after receiving a tip about a body buried in a yard. Well, in just the past 20 minutes, police told us they did not find a body. The home is located on Woodland Avenue near 4th Street in Cocoa Beach. News 6's James Barbero joins us there live now, where police are still investigating what happened. James. And they say, even though they found nothing, Ginger, that this is an active investigation, and whoever that tip came from this morning, they're going to track down all leads they have. The Sheriff's Office and the Cocoa Beach Police Department, they are still on the scene here in this yard here on Woodland behind me, but they are about to leave. Video we captured in the past couple hours shows a more active scene when you saw a Cocoa Beach police officer on an excavator, operating that excavator and digging into the yard back there. For a time, the Sheriff's Office had up a barrier which would obstruct our view from seeing exactly what they were digging up and we were led to believe by the Cocoa Beach Police Department that they possibly may have a tip about a body buried back there. But all this time later, we now know that is not the case. I'll read from the official release we got earlier from Cocoa Beach Police Department. In just the past 30 minutes, they told us that throughout the day, law enforcement personnel excavated the backyards of the home. However, no human remains were found. This is a vacant home here on Woodland Avenue. We're told that no one's lived here for at least a year. Cocoa Beach Police, they do say they will continue to follow up on any leads, as we're mentioning, related to the tip, and therefore, this investigation will remain active and ongoing. So, despite not finding anything here, we all think that's good news. We did not find a dead body today. But, if anybody knows anything more about what's going on here, maybe in relation to that tip they got, which they didn't tell us much about, besides the fact that there may have been a body, which they now say there was not, the Cocoa Beach Police Department still wants to hear from you. Live tonight in Cocoa Beach, I'm James Sparbero, getting results, News 6. Back to you. James, thanks for sorting that out. Well, tonight we are hearing new frantic 911 calls from employees begging for help after a man with a rifle stormed a Walgreens. Three women who work at the store called 911. Two of them made it out of the pharmacy safely while a third hid inside an office. News 6's Lauren Korn joins us with the new calls and the latest on the suspect who was eventually shot by police. Lewis Curler did not say a word in first appearance today. He's being held without bond. We're learning more about what happened inside Walgreens with 911 calls and where exactly this man came from. 41 year old Lewis Curler is donning an orange jumpsuit and stood quiet, shaking a bit. Hours after police say the armed man approached the pharmacy counter inside Walgreens, demanding drugs and money. I don't know if he's under the influence of something, but He's trying to hide in the pharmacy and he said people are out to get him. You're listening to one Walgreens employee on the phone with 911 and can hear how the situation escalated quickly. Oh, he's in it. He's got a rifle. Hurry up. He's got a rifle. Another pharmacy tech calls 911 from outside. I just started jumping the counter and I, my pharmacist team went towards him and I ran out of the pharmacy and he, as I was running out, I saw him pull out the gun. <laughs> And, um, and they just ran and got people out of the store. Police say Curler then injected the narcotics as police raced to the counter. They say that's when he stood up with the rifle and pointed it in their direction. Police firing one shot, striking Curler in the lower buttocks area. Police say Curler was hospitalized at Halifax Health Medical Center a day or two prior before showing up to the store, but it's still unclear how long he stayed there. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Judge Weston. We're here this afternoon for first appearance. Today, Curler's public defender argued for the judge to grant a bond. While the state argued for two additional charges of aggravated assault with a firearm and kidnapping, the judge declined to rule on the motion at this time. News 6 asked Walgreens corporate office about security measures. Corporate responding saying in part, quote, we are committed to providing a safe environment for our customers and employees and have a number of different security measures in place throughout our stores. In Daytona Beach, Lauren Korn getting results, News 6. 
A major step in the push to get results and drive change hits a roadblock. Today, the Florida Senate temporarily postponed a vote on a bill aimed at cracking down on distracted driving. It comes one day after the House passed a similar bill, which only focuses on typing while driving. The Senate's version takes it a step further by making Florida a hands-free state behind the wheel. But both versions of the bill have to match up before making its way to the governor's desk. Do you, do you feel like the Senate is open to the House's bill or? You know, this is the process. So, um, you know, if we're not open to it, then, um, you know, that's how things don't get done. And um, so I would say we're, we're open to suggestions and ideas. We don't have any pride of authorship on these things. It, what that bill's about is saving lives. News 6 anchor Matt Austin has been leading News 6's push for stricter texting and driving laws. To get updated on our coverage and our mission, just head to clickorlando.com slash driving change. Caught on camera, a wanted suspect leads deputies on a chase. This is video from a Seminole County Sheriff's Office chopper. 28-year-old Randolph Moses was involved in a minor fender bender and took off. The camera caught him running onto I-4 under a semi and into traffic. He was wanted for violation of parole out of Jacksonville. A dispute over a bathroom ends with a man stabbed and a 72-year-old in jail. DeLand Police and Volusia County deputies arrested Dan Johnson on stabbing charges. They say he got into an argument with his nephew because his nephew was taking too long in the bathroom. Police say Johnson opened the door and stabbed him several times. I've been stabbed three or four times. I've got help coming to you, okay? I mean, this is the person that did this to you still there? Yeah. Please hurry up. His nephew, Michael Johnson, was airlifted to the hospital. We're told he is expected to survive. Well, another member of Mount Dora's police department is on paid leave tonight. This marks the second person this month to have an internal investigation launched involving their actions. News 6's Vanessa Ariza has been looking into this and has more from Mount Dora. In early April, Mount Dora's police chief was placed on leave after reports he made racially insensitive comments at a charity event. Two days later, a sergeant within the department was also placed on paid leave. This marks the fourth employee within the department to undergo an internal investigation within the past two years. Two separate investigations are ongoing tonight involving Mount Dora Zone. Chief John O'Grady remains on paid leave after he reportedly made racially insensitive comments earlier this month. Sergeant Keith Taylor was placed on leave last Monday. A spokesperson with the city releasing a statement today saying, quote, Sergeant Keith Taylor was relieved of duty with pay on April 15, 2019, pending the outcome of a standards of conduct investigation. The city declined an on-camera interview and won't say exactly what initiated the internal investigation. We asked the mayor and all council members for a comment. We only heard back from two, Councilor Lori Tillette declining to comment and Councilor Chrissy Style who told us she was only aware of the chief's paid leave status, adding she was told city council would be provided updates as necessary in the weekly meetings. But at this time, there is nothing to report. Sergeant Taylor declined to give a comment at the advice of his labor and union attorney as far as a time frame on when these investigations will wrap up. We haven't been given one. In Mount Dora tonight, Vanessa Ariza getting results, News 6. All right, it has been a beautiful week, but a change could be in our future. That's right, Tom is here with when we can expect some rain, Tom. It's knocking on the door. You see it right there in Texas right now from Dallas down to Houston. Some of that's going to march across the Gulf of Mexico. I will pinpoint its arrival and explain what it means to the start of your weekend. First, though, a new dance has the Internet crazy in love. It's so popular, it's even garnered the attention of Beyonce. Beyonce has 127 million followers. Never in this world would I have thought that she would even, like, dare see a video um, that I posted. Meet the Central Florida dancers who created it next. You're watching News 6 at 6, getting results for Cocoa Beach, Oviedo, and all of Central Florida. We will be right back. Florida Hospital is now Advent Health. The same doctors you know, the same care you trust. Caring for your body, mind, and spirit. Live with Matt Austin. Lisa Bell, weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells, sports with Jamie Say, and special reports from the investigators. This is News 6 at 6, getting results. Well, there is a new dance challenge sweeping the internet. 
It's to a new song on Beyonce's latest album, Homecoming. Now, Queen Bee has actually been posting videos of people doing the dance on her Instagram. You want to give it a try? No, I do not. <laughs> new Six is Amanda Castro. <laughs> spoke with the creators of the Before I Let Go Challenge, and they are right here in Central Florida. Orlando dancers Fred Barthel and Fabron Alexis are still in shock. Honestly, at a loss of words. The pair, now viral sensations, and the masterminds behind a new challenge taking over social media. Honestly, it just blew up overnight and it was crazy. It all started a week ago after Alexis watched Beyonce's new Netflix documentary and listened to her new live album. The dancers were in the studio the next day, choreographing moves to her remake of the song Before I Let Go, sharing their video on social media with the hashtag Before I Let Go Challenge. We posted on Instagram first and then we put on Twitter and then Twitter started getting more. Their video getting thousands of views and inspiring others to participate in the challenge, even capturing the attention of Queen Bee herself. And we started getting a whole bunch of DMs about congratulations, congratulations. We're like, what are you talking about? On Monday, Beyonce took to her social media, sharing videos of people participating in the challenge on her Instagram story, spotlighting the Orlando dancers first. Beyonce has 127 million followers. Never in this world would I have thought that she would even, like, dare see a video um, that I posted. And they even taught me some of the moves. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Woo! The dancers grateful for the singer's support, saying she plays such an important role in their lives. It inspired me to work even harder. Now I just really want to inspire like I'm being inspired right now. In Orlando, Amanda Castro getting results, News 6. I want to know how long it took her to shoot that one little... Amanda? Yes. No, she, obviously, those are not fake moves. You can't just do that for a story during a day turn. I mean... She has some skills. Obviously. I've known her since she interned here like a decade ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> she went away, became a reporter, comes like, I had no... Never knew she could do that. Big paradigm shift. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, uh, Beyonce and her 127 million Instagram mm -hmm. followers, I just checked mine. I have about 2,000. <laughs> so slightly less than Beyonce. There will be greaters and lessers, Ginger. If you good can for start guys. singing and dancing like Beyonce, maybe you'll Correct. be there one day too. Correct. Hey, take a look at what's going on tonight. Mild with patchy fog on the way for late night tonight. We're doing really well right now. If you have outdoor plans, go ahead, have fun. Temperatures are going to drop slowly into the evening before producing some fog late. Through the day tomorrow, we're dry, but we are hot. And by hot, I mean 88. That's hot for April, normal daytime high. About 84, but we're going to thump that high tomorrow. Come Friday, scattered storms return. I don't think it's going to be nearly as wicked as it was last Friday, but still some activity on the way. Here's the visible satellite. One of the good things about the time change and getting warmer into the spring, late spring, summertime is that sun stays up longer, so my visible satellite picture stays good into the evening hours. Here's the visible satellite right now from Dallas to Houston, Texas. Look at that low cranking up right there. That's going to be your rainmaker. It's going to pull a cold front right across the Gulf of Mexico, rolling our way by Friday. Between now and then, not much changes. Daytona Beach looks great, 79 degrees here at news time. Downtown Orlando, health camera, temperature reading at news time is 85. Wind from the southeast at 7. Humidity is not too bad, 38% right now. That'll change starting tomorrow. We're going to load up on the humidity first and then get the big showers late. 85 Orlando, 87 in Gainesville. Gainesville hasn't budged. I mean, maybe something wrong. I'll check it and see if it's updating or not. 79 degrees at the Cape, 78 in Melbourne, 79 again, Daytona Beach. Radar tonight is dry and will stay that way. Here's the water vapor loop. The blues and the whites, that's abundant moisture. And man, is it building from Texas to Louisiana all the way into Oklahoma. Eventually, it rolls our way. The core of the low itself goes to the northeast, but the frontal zone will be dragged straight across the Gulf of Mexico and come to see us by Friday. Here's the way it goes tonight. Now, no big deal tonight. Tomorrow morning, a touch of patchy fog in the northern zones early. By 7 p.m. tomorrow night, we get a touch of an east coast sea breeze. Does not produce rain. But look at this. Friday morning, 9 a.m., scattered showers breaking out along the frontal boundary from Ocala all the way down to the villages. So we're talking Sumter County, Lake County, getting the rain at 9 a.m. Between 9 and noon, the frontal zone loses a lot of its mojo, pushes into central Florida, goes south, and I think, I really believe, this is two or three model runs in a row now, this has happened. Much of the big rain will be out of here for Friday evening. So that by Friday at 6 p.m., if you have outdoor plans, you right now look like you're good to go. Check back with me tonight at 11 for the next model run.
Lows tonight, 50s and 60s all over. Call in the low in Orlando, 60. Here's tomorrow. Your forecast brought to you by Del Air Heating and Air Conditioning. A touch of patchy fog north overnight, then mostly sunny tomorrow. The high is 88. Here's your week ahead. We go to that daytime high tomorrow of 88. The low tomorrow night is 65. Then on Friday, a 60% chance of rain that starts by midday in Orlando, but gets on out of here. Lower rain chances for the weekend with highs in the mid 80s. That looks good, Tom. Thank you. Well, it wasn't Beyonce, but there was a real life star sighting in Central Florida. Yeah, see who turned up in Titusville, not to dance, but for a <laughs> bite of lobster bisque. That's on News 6 at 7. Also, he is accused of kidnapping and killing a woman two years ago, but his murder trial cannot move forward without a crucial decision how a handwritten letter to the judge played a role. Eric. I'm going to show you how technology has evolved almost in a scary way that bad guys are using to skim your credit card at the pump these days and also how it's evolved for deputies catching them and getting crime results. All right, Sports Director Jamie Say joins us now, and we're just about 24 hours removed from that magic loss. Yeah. Still stings. Yeah, it still does, but when you look back, season was a success. A yeah, success. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, Magic flew home from Toronto today. The offseason officially is underway now. It's not the way they wanted things to end, obviously, but call this season a success. This group set franchise records for positive things in Steve Clifford's first year as coach. I'm going to tell you all about it next. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I the mean, meme, it was Paul George. He had to shoot over him. It was a great shot. The yeah. memes on social media today are great yeah. Yeah. as well. Jamie, right, thank, thank you. you. We'll be right back. <laughs> so today. Well, we are out of time. Thanks for joining us. The CBS Evening News is next. You can always get the latest at clickorlando.com. We'll be back at 7 with more local news. Have a great Wednesday night.